Okay, so we're still doing a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. Um, basically because that's exactly what Jesus did, and Jesus always did what pleased the Father, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You look at his immediate apostles, and Peter did it at Pentecost, and Paul did it in most of his letters, but even when he was before Felix, you know, and um, Stephen, before he was stoned. The reason he was stoned, he was explaining the, a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. I have to sneeze, I can feel it. Anyway, so, and it's not just, you know, I mean, a lot of people go, well, we're Ray Comfort, Ray Comfort. Well, it's not just Ray Comfort. I mean, John MacArthur's book that I own on, I own his book on evangelism, it's the same thing. It's a lot of the proud and grace of the humble and, you know, a correct understanding of what good is. The rich young ruler, you know, runs up, you know, good teacher. And Jesus corrects him and says, there's none good but God. Romans 3 explains there's none good but God. There's none that seek after God. There is no seeker sensitive movement because there's none that seek after God. Men, you know, hate the light and love the darkness because lest their deeds be reproved, you know. Um, sorry, that was kind of a com convolution between John and <laughs> the Gospel of John and Romans. Um, anyway, but... uh that being the point, and again, I mean, you know, did Jesus do it? Yes, rich young ruler, um, the Good Samaritan story, the and John four, John eight, John four with the Samaritan woman at the well, and John eight with the woman caught in the very act of adultery, and in Matthew five, he did the same thing. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you know, not a jot or a tittle of the law shall pass away till all is fulfilled. He'll follow up and say, you've heard it said of old, y'all shall not murder, but I tell you, who hates his brother without cause is in danger of the judgment. Who calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. And then he follows that up and says, You've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. He's speaking back to the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. But I tell you, he who looks upon a woman with lust has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And then further on in Matthew, I think it's up in the 30s, like 530, I think he, he makes um, reference back to adultery again, but this time referring to divorce. You know, if a, if, a, if a man divorces a woman for any reason but adultery and then remarries, he causes, he commits adultery and causes and if a woman divorces her husband for any reason but adultery or infidelity and then remarries, then she commits adultery. Um, but again, I mean, it's examples of Jesus, the master, using a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. So what did Jesus do is the, the, the way of the master version. You know, what did Jesus do? Kind of the stepping stones and then see craft or crafting the message. You know, the W, would you consider yourself a good person? And that'll expose their understanding of good. And we have to explain that good, by definition, is used in God. One of the definitions is moral perfection. So would you consider yourself a good person? Well, it will show someone either, you know, contrite and broken and understanding that, you know, they're poor in, poor in spirit, et cetera, or hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is only implanted by God because none, no man, natural man in and of himself seeks after God. Um... Anyway, tangential. So, would you consider yourself a good person? Yes, no. Uh, there's none good but God, you know. So, obviously the answer is no. Uh, anything other than that exposes us, our own self-righteousness, our own idolatry of ourselves. And if, we, if we're confused about that or unclear about it, we're thinking left and right, or the horizontal between, yeah, I'm not Hitler, but I'm not Pol Pot. I'm not, you know, Stalin, but I'm not Gandhi, or, you know... <laughs> whatever fill in the blank it, it's not a matter of, of how it looks left and right this is a matter of how it looks between you and god and god's standard of good is moral perfection so if you're not morally perfect and god says none is then automatically one you're a liar but two that means you've broken you know number nine of the commandments um anyway so then again you know have you ever told a lie it's pretty much a yes no have you ever you know um stolen anything regardless of value or size of the object, or the time that you did it. Have you ever, you know, made copies on the company time? Have you ever clocked in early or late? Have you ever taken a pencil, an eraser, a piece of paper, you know, anything that wasn't yours, or weren't given permission for? You know, I don't care if it's a dollar or a billion, if you take it out of somebody else's pocket, it's not rightfully yours or offered to you, it's theft. And, um, you know, Jesus says if your hand, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to enter life, you know, less a member, missing a member, than for the whole, you know, body to perish. He also says that about the eye. We made the comment about adultery. You know, Jesus says the liquid lust is adultery. Um, he also says, 
you know, pretty clearly there forward that you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's better to, you know, lose a member than and enter life, you know, sans a member than you know the whole body be cast into hell. If with the understanding that we're going to be judged by the Ten Commandments, would we be innocent or guilty? And that's the J. You know, what did Jesus do? Would you consider yourself a good person? Do you keep the Ten Commandments? And judgment. You know, if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, would you be guilty or innocent? And most people would be pretty straightforward and say, guilty. And then they'll give all their excuses. But again, guilty. And the next one would be... Um, what did Jesus do? The D is destiny. So if you're found guilty by God, um, you know, it's appointed once a man to die and then the judgment. If you're found guilty in the judgment, heaven or hell? And surprisingly, there's a lot of people that will say, well, heaven, because God's loving and forgiving and he'll just overlook it and he'll, he'll wash me clean and, you know, pardon my sin. And if God, your creator, is a good judge, a righteous judge, he couldn't just overlook it. That would make him a corrupt judge, a good judge, which have to see that justice is served. So the one thing that people are banking on, that God will just overlook it, if they go, well, you know, I know I'm guilty, you made a good case, you know, and I am guilty, but, you know, I think you're a good judge, and I think you'll just overlook it, because, you know, I feel badly, and I, I won't do it again, and, you know, can you just pardon it, make it go away, and just let me skate? A corrupt judge could do that, but a good judge is going to tell you, yes, you should not You should feel horrible, you shouldn't do it again, but I can't overlook it because I'm a good judge, I have to see the justice is served. So the one thing that people are banking on is the one thing that's going to truly condemn them, that he's a good judge. Um, but again, that's the correction of the word good, moral perfection. Um, so then that's the, the what did Jesus do? Would you consider yourself a good person? Do you keep the Ten Commandments? Um, judgment, innocence or guilt? And then destiny, heaven or hell. And then we flip to the other side, which is the crafting of the message for sea craft. Does that concern you? It concerns me or I wouldn't be doing this. It concerns God or Jesus wouldn't have come and taken the cross, died and resurrected from the grave. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have, would not have had to conquer sin and death if it wasn't a big deal. I mean, one lie was enough to get a husband and wife killed in the book of Acts, right? Because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, I mean... The case of the woman in John 8, caught in the very act of adultery. The laws, you know, calls for her blood. She was caught, found guilty, a couple witnesses, that's it. Stone her to death, right? Done. There you go. You know, um, it's really not that hard. If a child in the Old Testament was found dishonoring his parents, they were they would stone the child to keep the evil, evil out of the camp and keep it from going to the next generation. Um, you know, David and Jesus both were accused of violating the sabbath by taking what you know what's uh, it's apostles through well he healed on the sabbath and that was you know frowned upon because no work would be done well you know if one of your own was stuck in a ditch wouldn't you help him out if you know you wouldn't wait till the next day but anyway so uh, the point being and that's just you know four of them basically is all we really looked at if we look at the rest of them we'll see that you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was a day of rest. God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested not from all his labor. But he's still working today. You know, he's, he still works. It's just he's not doing creation. He did his six days of creation and rested from that work. You know, all things are held together in, in, in his hands and for, of, and by him, you know, for Jesus. That's the way that's read. You know, read, read John, first chapter of John, Gospel of John. You know, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, all things were made by Him, of Him, through Him, and for Him. And, um, okay, so the C, does that concern you? It concerns me, or I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't share the gospel if I wasn't concerned. It would be depraved indifference for me not to do this, because this is what I'm... I, I don't want any should perish, and I think, you know, Almighty God, that He saw fit to send somebody my way, because, you know, without the preaching of the gospel, I'd probably be perished. Just because I'd heard it, you know, I've, I was told later on that you hear it maybe seven times before it sinks. And for me, it didn't make any sense. And, there, you know, the cross didn't make any sense and hell didn't make any sense. But we'll get into that in a minute. As it was presented, because, you know, basically in high school and college and thereafter, it was a matter of all kinds of different gospels, but not the, not the true gospel. And we'll get into that. And, you know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just leave that between God and man. 
Anyway, so does that concern you? Yes, my answer is yes. And if, if you find out that you've been judged guilty by God and you know your destiny is hell, that should concern you. If it doesn't concern you, I'm more worried about you than I should because that means the God of this world has still blinded you. And even if you're awakened but not alarmed, you know, it's that's like ignoring a smoke alarm. You know, you should be frightened if, if it's warning you of, you know, the wrath to come and flee from the wrath to come, please. I'm begging you, depart from iniquity. Anyway, so that now we come to the cross and the cross finally made sense when I understood what it meant by it is finished. When Jesus is on the cross and he cries out before his last breath, it is finished. That's, you know, the... the the words that were spoken there are the words used basically in the Greek for a debt has been paid in full. And then I look back at the garden when he says that, I've, I've, you know, if this cup of wrath could pass from me, if not, nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. Understanding that, that you know, when we sin, we sin with knowledge consciously that we're sinning against a holy, righteous God, that we're in rebellion and that we're, you know, being idolatrous and we're blaspheming the name of God and not keeping the Sabbath, because the first and second commandment, the, fir the first commandment and the second end to it when Jesus spoke in the New Testament was, you still got to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself, do this and live. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And, um, you know, I mean, with that said, then what's the answer? The answer is, if we're not loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving our neighbor, as ourself. We can't claim to be doing those two things and lying and stealing and being covetous, um, greedy as it were. And th that's one that's, you know, not used in, in that presentation is, is thou shalt not covet, you know, thy neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, male servant, female servant, you know, donkey, oxen or whatever, fill in the blank. Because that comes down to, again, the second commandment of graven images and idolatry. Because that's thanklessness. Whatever God has blessed you with, including every breath and heartbeat, you know, if you're comparing to others that, well, I deserve, or, you know, God cheated me on this, or, you know, I'm going to go get mine, as it were, that's discontent. If you find, if you can find contentment in Christ, you know, whether you're abased or abound, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in, in jail or, you know, in a mansion, you've still got the, the pearl of great price if you have Christ. You've got the only treasure that, that matters, you know, don't store up treasures on earth or, or, Moth and dust corrupt, but store it for yourself treasures in heaven. Um, anyway, so back to the cross, you know, he cries out, It is finished, the debt is paid and fully drink the wrath, the cup of wrath, every drop of the cup of wrath that we deserve, because every sin that we commit, we commit with knowledge that that it's sin and that it's against God, and it's in rebellion to God, and we're storing up wrath for ourselves in the day of wrath, because it's appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. We're back to the judgment. You know, if you're judged by the Ten Commandments, innocent or guilty, destiny, heaven or hell. Therein lies the cross. If, if there's an actual you know, awakened and alarmed at that point, you can go from concern to cross. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus, Jesus conquered the two things that eternally separate man from God. And that's sin and death. And by Jesus, you know, taking off his robes and stepping out of eternity and into time, splitting it effectively and if you don't want to do bc and and you know his coming then if you want to do before current era and current era it's still split time in the west and there's a reason for that it was the man jesus christ fully god and fully man okay so he steps off steps off his throne and into eternity humbles and humiliates himself to become one of his own creation man and to live a sinless and blameless life and take the mocking and the scourging and the spitting and the, you know if you're the son of God, you know, come down off the cross and the ripping of the flesh and the Roman scourging and the rest of it and and drank that cup of wrath and paid my fine. Let me see if I can put it like this. So I'm standing before God and I'm being judged by God, and he says, Here's the charges, here's the evidence. How do you plead? And I have no, I, I have no excuse. There's nothing to say other than guilty as charged. And Jesus walks in and says, Father, I drank the wrath that he deserves. Evan committed these sins. I took his wrath. We don't have to send him to hell. That, that hole, that puncture mark, that blood that was let for the remission of that sin, that sin he committed, that's why I took that, that thorn 
from that crown and shed that blood was for that sin. The nail I took was for that sin. The stripes across my back was for these. this list of these sins, the hole in my foot, the spear in my side, the, when they punched me, when they spit on me, when they beat me in the back of the head. A fleshless back, you know, muscle and sinew exposed to carry that, that tree, that you know, Roman torture device. So by his sinless life, and his death on the cross, which is, of course, you know, an, an offense to the Jews, because every man hung on a tree is accursed by God. And that's exactly what Isaiah says, you know, it pleased the Father to crush the Son, and Jesus became a curse for us. He took the curse and became a curse so we could have his righteousness. That's the trade off. Romans 6.23 is, is one I typically bounce off of. It's the wages of sin is death. Wages is, is what we earn for the work that we do. And all we do is sin. That's all we know to do. That's all we've ever done. You know, our best works are filthy rags. There's nothing we can use to uh, 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 commend ourselves to God. Nothing we can offer. It's empty hands. You know, there's nothing I can bring. There's no way I can bribe a, bribe a, a, a good, righteous, holy judge. You know, that's all it is, is bribery. Anything I bring to him is like me trying to bring a menstrual rag and say, look what I got for you. You know, just get me square. You know, well, you know, I mean, you, you have the ones that went before he said, you know, depart from me, I never knew you, was we've healed, we've raised the dead, we've you know, healed the lepers, we've, we, you know, fill in the blanks, all these acts of righteousness they did to be seen before men, one or two, to try to barter again with God without going through, without going through Christ. Jesus says, no man comes to the Father but through me. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And before you yell at me about exclusive, be even more amazed that he made a way at all. And that God was the one that stepped off the throne, took the wrath that we deserve for the crimes that we committed against him unto death, and death on a cross. Okay, so with his death on the cross, he conquered sin by taking the wrath that we deserve. And God, you know, it is finished. It's paid in full. And by his resurrection, he conquered death. And he's coming again in glory to just living in the dead. That kingdom will have no end. But again, the two things that eternally have separated us from God is sin, our sin against him, and death, which is the curse that we, that we received for that sin. God fixed it. He made a way. Okay, so that's the cross. And I, I guess I need to back it up because there was a point in time that I thought, well, you know, the cross didn't make any sense until I understood that it is finished in the cup of wrath. But before that, hell never made sense. And it, it just seemed extreme, right? For if the time of a man is 70 years, and I don't care if he lives 70 years or 900 years, you know, it seemed like the crimes committed by finite man seemed a little extreme to be, have to be paid eternally, you know. And then it got reflected back on me by someone that said, okay, well, if it takes you 13 seconds to commit murder, if you're found guilty in a court of law, do they send you to jail for 13 seconds? Is that equitable? No, it's not equitable. If it takes me four and a half minutes to defraud Social Security of $65 million and steal all that money from people that are depending on it to pay for their med their, their, their life-sustaining medications or their food or their housing, and it only took me four and a half minutes to do it, and I'm found guilty of those charges, you know... It, even if I paid the money back, four and a half minutes in jail is, is not restitution. It's not equitable, right? And again, the, the second flip of that was, it, it's, okay, well, I get that. Then then what about equity? I mean, what is equitable? And it wasn't until it, that I understood that God is eternal, holy, righteous, just, loving, merciful, long-suffering, or I wouldn't be here. He has spared my life consistently until he, until he saved my soul. And now the only reason that he could possibly have me here is to follow his other commandments, is to preach the gospel to all creation and to make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, this is the clarion call, kids. Anyway, so, um, uh, again, it came to, it seemed a bit extreme. And then it, the, the example given was, if I threaten the life of my dog, my dog's not going to take me to court. It may not trust me. It may not want to be around me. If I threaten the life of my children, one, the children are going to be taken from my home, and I'm probably going to do some time. If I do the same to my wife, same thing. I'm going to lose my wife, and I'm probably going to lose my freedom. If I do it to, for example, you know, someone in a position of authority, say, 
militaristic leader, cop, or whatever what the case might be, FBI, CIA, whatever. I threaten their life. I'm probably gonna, you know, be death by cop if I. If I and until this presidency, if I would have threatened the life of the president, I would have spent life incarcerated, probably in Leavenworth. But before this president, you know, that meant something. It was who you committed the crime against, more than the crime made the difference. So for me to commit all these crimes against the man, the the man, the God that created me against an eternal, holy, righteous, merciful, loving, long-suffering, patient God who made a way through Jesus Christ. And whether I accept or reject that will determine my eternity at this point. And we'll get to that. But the understanding of who I committed these crimes against, the only way they can be paid is in eternity. There is no equitable, equitable exchange of, well, I committed these crimes against a holy, righteous, eternal God, and maybe a finite being can spend a finite time, you know, in, for example, a, a Catholic, a, a, a Catholic, or whatever purgatory, and then pay for it, and then be set free. You know, there's other works, righteousness, um, um, religions that you know prescribe to that type of thing. You you do a penance, you do a time, and then you know you're either promoted or or not. Um, as it were, but okay. So back to that. So back to the cross and concern, you know. And the next one is is the A and and the, the next one is is the R, right? So cra the the R in, in C craft is repentance, you know, confess and forsake, flee from the wrath to come, you know. Those who name the name of Christ must depart from iniquity. Uh, you you can't you know keep a foot in the world and a foot in heaven. You you try to walk that barbed wire fence and it's going to cause you pain and eventually you won't be able to do it it will either cut you in half and you know cause you to stumble and fall but anyway that that comes back to again you know idolatry you know we, we can't sit on this throne of self-righteousness to say well i named the name of christ and i've got my ticket to heaven but i'm going to keep doing what i want to do i'm going to keep living in sin and you know one foot in the world and one foot in heaven it's, it just it can't happen you know you, you will find yourself in that position of department for me you never knew, i never knew you you know, workers of iniquity. So we're back to the, the repent, and that's confess and forsake. You know, flee from sin. It's not to change of mind. It's a change of direction, a change of belief. One thing. At one point in time, all these things were really cool with me. I liked to drink. I liked to fool around. I liked to do all these other things. And now, it, you know, I agree with God that these are wrong, and I don't want them anymore. And instead of this big struggle and fight because I've, I've got people that do that I've got friends that still do the yeah but I'm tired of the struggle you know I'm tired of the fight it's all guilt and shame and oppression and no those are the batteries in the smoke detector letting you know that to flee from the danger you know your world's on fire hell is coming judgment's around the corner and flee from the wrath to come you know be thankful you still have a conscience he hasn't handed you over to a reprobate mind Right? If you still have guilt, you still have a conscience, you still have a chance. And if you understand that you can't be you cannot be tempted by that which you don't want. Right? Satan Satan can only tempt us by what we want. And we are, you know, if you read James, it makes it abundantly clear that Satan doesn't even have to do it. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You know, we're only tempted by that which we already already desire. And you know, when we lust and then it's you know, conceived and sin and then eventually death. So the the answer the the bingo the 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 light that went off was if i can't be tempted by that which i don't desire so please god align my desires with yours to love what you love and hate what you hate and yes i stumble and yes i fall but i don't like it and i don't stay there i run to him and if i understand that i'll never be tempted more than he'll give me a way out don't wait until it's too late. Don't don't stick your foot in the pool of sin and think maybe I can get away with it. It's the alcoholic in one drink. It's a it's a bender now, right? I mean, it's the uh, you know I can get away with it a little bit. I'll just 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 a, just a little bit of poison. I should be okay. Not always the way it works. Okay, so repent. And then we have the F, which is faith. And faith is is more than just belief, right? I mean, I can. I can believe in God. I can have a head knowledge of God, but that doesn't that impact my life, right? Wisdom isn't wisdom until that knowledge is applied. I can have head knowledge all day about and believe and nod that Jesus is the Son of God, 
and that, you know, God is one. But even the demons believe the difference is they tremble. They have a fear of the Lord that, that, that many don't. I mean, they can acknowledge in the head that, yes, you know, I can, I can name the name of Christ and Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Absolutely. It's a good start, but it's not where you stop, right? You have to depart from iniquity. All who name the name of Christ must depart from iniquity. Run if when when tempted and you feel like you're going to trip and fall, run to him, run to Jesus. You know, run from the sin, flee from immorality. Right, all these things. But that's the encapsulate. I, I can't be tempted by that which I don't desire. So I pray that God would change the desires of my heart to align with His will, and that His will would be done and with and through my life, to His glory, and my good. Back to Romans. Okay, so, and 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 faith is is. This might be a ridiculous southern definition, but it's it's belief with feet, right? And it's it's a matter of we do the will of the Father, we do as we commanded. John fifteen tells us that, you know, if we love God, we'll we'll keep his commandments. You know, if you love me, you'll you'll keep my commandments. Fair enough. Okay, and then trust. The last in that in the crafting of the message or sea craft is trust. And the one of the explanations that really I like, and it's a great comfort, is of the way of the master was, was the, the explanation of true and false conversions. You know, why did they come to, why did they put on the Lord Jesus Christ, as it were, like you would put on a parachute? It's not a matter of belief; it's a matter of action. It's a matter of trust. And um, the example given is, you know, two passengers on a plane. One's told that the, you know, given the gospel, and he's told that the parachute, you know, put on the parachute, it'll improve your flight. Well, it doesn't because it's uncomfortable and it's cumbersome and it's cutting up the circulation. He can't sit correctly. And people are mocking him for it. Eventually, it doesn't improve his flight and he sees it doesn't improve his flight. He's going to, you know, take up the parachute, throw it on the floor and be rightfully, you know, angry and hardened against the people that told him it would improve his flight because it didn't do as promised. It did not perform as promised. And that, that for me, is the same as, you know, and I'm going to probably hurt some feelings here, but the, the prosperity gospel, the health, wealth, you know, the name it and claim it, the whole deal and no gospel, if you want peace, love, joy, faith, the people that name the, the, the fruit of the spirit and try to use that as a calling card without people understanding that, you know, patience is born in, in tribulation, right? You don't have, you don't just get patience because everything's smooth, long suffering. I mean, let's look at the fruit, some of the fruit of the spirit, you know, love, Kindness, which means you have to be kind to those who are unkind to you. Love, you have to love the ones, the unloving, the unlovable, or the ones that are unloving towards you. Uh, patience, you have to be patient with those that try you. You have long suffering. You learn that by being, by long suffering, by suffering long. Uh, goodness, you learn goodness by dealing with your badness and others' badness and self control. Well, you don't have to have self control unless things have you near the edge. Okay, so we're back on the plane again. And and now we're told that we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the parachute, because at some point in this flight, we're going to have to jump out of this plane, right? So it's one, it's appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. And we've kind of went through the judgment already, you know, guilty or innocent, destiny, heaven or hell. And we've explained the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ put him on. It's not, to, it's not life enhancement. It's not life improvement. It's not your best life now. It's understanding that life is short. You're a pilgrim walking through and eternity is what we're facing flee from the wrath to come because eternity is a really long time for a short life full of pleasures of sin for a season anyway so in with the understanding that if i if i jump out of the plane without the parachute the law of gravity i'll be found guilty and i'll die and i'll perish in my sins right the law of gravity is going to judge me i'll be judged by the law of gravity found guilty and i will die i'll perish but if i put on the lord jesus christ i put on my parachute when I have to, when I'm forced out of that plane, when it's appointed once I'm going to die and then the judgment, I have the safety and security of the Savior, right? Yeah, I had to jump out of the plane, but I've been saved. He's saved me eternally. I was born again, right? A new heart, a new creation. John 3, you know, don't be amazed that I say that a man must be born again. Um, you know, by water and by spirit. Okay, so we've gone through what did... What did Jesus do? You know, would you consider yourself a good person? Do you keep the Ten Commandments? Judgment, you know, guilty or innocent. Destiny, heaven or hell. Sea craft, crafting the message. Does that concern you? The cross, repentance, and faith and trust. And that summarizes it. And of course, it's not just, you know, the Ray Comfort version of it. John MacArthur, 
you know, Paul Washer, Kyle Eidelman, uh, Matt Chandler, David Platt, Billy Graham, Dr. Bill Bright at the end of his life did a book just on the Ten Commandments, you know. Um, Ravenhill, Tozer, Pink, C.S. Lewis, Spurgeon, Moody, Edwards, Edwards, Whitfield, the Puritans, you know, all the way back to Jesus Christ. You can see it in Matthew 5. You can see it, you know, in Romans and Hebrews and Corinthians, the letters from Paul. Um, you can see it in the Gospel of John. You can see it in all the Gospels, especially the Synoptic Gospels. But Matthew 5 is a good example. Um, John 4 and John 8. You know, the Samaritan woman at the well, the rich young ruler. Um, Luke and, and the Good Samaritan. So, I mean, it's there. It's a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. And one quick question will tell you if they understand, you know, good, that there's none good but God. Do you consider yourself a good person? If they start looking left and right, then you know it's a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. Anyway. And like I said, I mean, I only do this because this is what I'm commanded to do. In the end of Mark, you know, Jesus said to go and um, preach the gospel to all creation. At the end of Matthew, he tells us to, um, you know, go and make disciples of all men, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make disciples, preach the gospel. And at the end of the letter from Jude, and in the high 20s, because there's only one, it's only, you know, it's not a chapter one, chapter two, but in the end, it says, on, you know, on some have compassion, having compassion, making a difference. On others, save with fear, even despising or hating the garment defiled by the flesh. Depending because, again, it doesn't, you know, if you're a King James or versus NASB or NIV or whatever. Fill in the blank. But um, there you go. There's the summation. It's a lot of the proud and grace of the humble because that's what Jesus did. We walked through a, a way to use it. And again, if, if someone, you know, needs a prayer of repentance, I'll pray with anyone that wants to you know, pray, come to the Father. I, I rarely ever give, you know, this whole, you know, uh, I'm going to say this with me in a parrot of prayer because if someone's truly broken over their sin and cries out to God, kind of like if a man cheated on his wife, right? I mean, he's not going to have me stand next to him and say, okay, well, John, you know, to Martha, say, I, John, have sinned against you and I, I'm praying that you would forgive me and take me back. Repeat after me, John. That doesn't make any sense. If a man is truly broken over what he did and the harm and injury and pain and the, and the broken trust and that broken covenant that he has against his wife, you're not going to have to lead him in a prayer. He's going to walk right up to the door and say, Honey, I have so messed up. I've, I've hurt you. I've, I've you know sinned against you. I've, I've broken trust. I've broken covenant. And I'm begging you to forgive me and I want to come home. I want to restore and reconcile this. You know? But if somebody wants to look at a prayer, go to Psalm 50, you know, the 51st Psalm. It's David after um, the Nathan prophet confronted him with his sin with, with Bathsheba and, and the adultery and the rest of it up to the murder of Uriah, her husband. But if you look at 2 Samuel, I think it's 11 and 12. If you read 11 and 12, you'll see, you know, one chapter is about the crime and the next chapter is, you know, Nathan the prophet confronting him about that sin. And David understanding that he's sinned against God and God alone. All these sins he committed up through, you know, coveting his neighbor, coveting Bathsheba and stealing her and sleeping with her, pregnant with her, and committing adultery with her, the fornication thereof, and murdering her husband. He's, you know, broken covenant with his family. I mean, he was the son of Jesse, you know, the leader of the army, leader of the people in the armies of, of God, that of Israel. You know, I mean, so obviously broke the Sabbath. There was the whole time that she was pregnant, he was covering it up. And, you know, broken the Sabbath, he's blaspheming the name of God, and you'll see that in Second Samuel, and where Nathan's confronting him that he did all these sins. You know, and he tried to keep concealing them in the dark, but he did them before the pagans. The pagans knew about it. He blasphemed the name of God before the Gentiles. That's idolatry because you know it's a graven image. He 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 um, tried to demote God and put himself on the throne of his own life as God of his own life. Yeah, I know what you say, God. I've known these rules and these commandments since my youth, but I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes, right? which is exactly what he did. And by doing that, he broke all the commandments because you cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and his strength and love your neighbor as yourself while you're stealing your neighbor's wife, sleeping with her, committing adultery, lying about it, having her, her husband killed, you know, dishonoring your parents, breaking the Sabbath, blaspheming the name of God before the Gentiles, um, you know, I, committing idolatry by putting yourself in place of God. I know what's right and wrong, but I'm going to do, I know what you say, but I'm going to do what I want. And, you know, bringing that wrath upon yourself. 
and you know breaking the first commandment therefore and of not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you don't know where those are, Deuteronomy 5, Exodus 20. And look at the the conditions surrounding the handing down of the law to Moses on the mount. You know, you have the trumpet sounding and the fire and the smoke and the pillar and the quaking. And there was a fear of the Lord that people were afraid to go near the mountain. Told, lest we go near the mountain, we'll die. You speak for us, speak to him with for us. You know, otherwise we'll perish. And even God says, they've spoken rightly, they will. And the only reason I do this is because God doesn't want you to perish. I don't want you to perish. That's why Jesus came. He's the way, the truth, and life. And before you cry exclusivity, remember that he made a way for all. You know, those who believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, right? If you believe in heart, confess it with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. And again, it's not always, you know, this method, okay? We've got the one verse evangelisms we do with John 3.16. You can find all these on YouTube. You can find all of these on YouTube. John 3.16, one verse... Um, Romans 6 23 one verse evangelism you can do all the bridges and use these you know these verses for that for the bridges you know God on one side man on the other side the cliff or the abyss in the middle you know and the cross of Christ you know making the bridge you can find all these you can do carrot terror gospels which I really really enjoy um, gospel in seven minutes is on there you know life in six words the one with propaganda doing the, the spoken spoken word is powerful stuff um, you know, you've got Need God, you've got GM28, you've got um, The Way of the Master, you've got The Good Person, you know, Are You a Good Person videos. You've got all of that, all of this available to you. If, if you need more of an apologetic stent, because, you know, apologetics is fantastic as long as it leads to the gospel. If it never gets to the gospel, you might win the argument, but, you know, God won't be, God won't be able to use you to save that soul if all you've done is won the argument. Does that make any sense? Because the ultimate goal is the gospel. The ultimate goal is the salvation. You know that God would that God would would you know bestow on this person eternal life and salvation. It's not about winning an argument. It's about God winning a soul. Right. Okay. So that's it for the minute. And I love you guys. And take this very seriously because I'm concerned, and I pray that you would be too. This is the clarion call, right? You've heard the gospel. You've heard it truthfully. If you have any questions, comment away. We'll get to it. Okay. I can't promise all able to answer all of it, you know immediately but I, I will do the best I can um, I still have people that are on my phone and on my email and on you know text me once in a while what about yeah yeah but eventually we'll get to that okay the apologetics is great as long as we get to the gospel and that you've got you know guys like stand to reason and reasonable faith and you know RZIM ministries and anybody on bot radio <laughs> currently and I'm just saying this because it's June 2020 okay anybody on bot radio is still you know, going to be a lot of the proud and grace of the humble. It'd be like, you know, any of those guys. And it doesn't matter if they passed away or not. If you're going to talk about Charles Daniel, or Adrian Rogers, or, you know, R.C. Sproul, and Linganeer, and all those guys. I mean, now R.Z.I.M., Ravi Zacharias, and Billy Graham. You know, I just... Anyway, a lot of the proud and grace of the humble, because that's what Jesus did. And it's always going to be the gospel. It's always going to be First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And if you need some apologetics on the backside... You know, to give us some context to whatever, because somebody said, well, I didn't believe that. Well, the, you know, 500 saw him. You know, most of them were still alive at the time of the writing. They could have been easily discounted it. But nobody did, right? The tomb was empty. He is risen. Hallelujah. All right, bye for now. Well, that went really long. Talk to you later. God loves you. So do I. Don't perish. <laughs>